Hello, my name is Jojo O'Brien. I work for the City of Madison's Engineering Division. And today I'm going to talk to you about the watershed studies that we'll be completing in 2019 and how those came about. So for a presentation overview, we're gonna talk about what happened, specifically in August of 2018, the flash flooding and the lake level flooding. We will discuss damage, both public and private, and how the city responded. Then we'll talk about why it happened, a review of flash flooding and design standards, and talk about next steps. So the city has city flood mitigation goals. We'll go over what a watershed is and how we've come about the concept of watershed studies and what those will look like. And then we will discuss what property owners can do with both self-reporting with an online survey, talking about how to prepare and prevent flooding at your home, and the use of backflow preventers and sump pumps, and the benefit of purchasing flood insurance. So on August 20th, 2018, the city experienced a tremendous amount of rain on the far west side of the city, which highlighted some serious systematic problems that require a larger perspective to resolve in a responsible manner. Statistically, the storm had a 0.1% to 0.2%, or 1 in 500 to 1 in 1,000 chance of occurring this year. This equates to a 500-year or 1,000-year design storm. A storm that is so large that it statistically has a 1% chance of occurring each year would yield 5.5 inches of rain in 8 hours. The storm on August 20th dropped 12 to 15 inches of rain in some areas. That's almost three times the amount of water. This was significantly more water than the storm sewer system was designed for, which resulted in damaged infrastructure, flooded streets, and in many cases, flooded homes. As you can see on the map here, um, we look at the different rainfall accumulation that fell across the city. This image was prepared by UW professor Dan Wright, who took KMKX radar that was bias corrected using rain gauges. And as you can see, the dark green portions of the map show zero to three inches of rain, which is a little bit more of a typical rain um, on the south and east side. And then as you move towards the west side in some of those dark red areas, you can see that 12 to 15 inches of rain fell in some parts of Madison. That rain caused a lot of damage. Um, here are some pictures to highlight that. On the far left, you can see Deming Way, where a greenway overtopping actually destroyed a whole section of the road. At Regent Street, a culvert beneath the street ended up washing away and some of Baker Ave, right where it meets Lake Mendota, ended up washing away as well. Here's some more damage in drainage ways and parks. On the left, you can see Glenwood Children's Park, and on the right, you can see damage at a public easement in the Wexford Village. Here you can see widespread standing water throughout the city. So this is at the Odana Golf Course on the left. Um, you can see cars stranded in parking lots and in the street on the right. And in the bottom right-hand corner, where that red arrow is pointing, you can see the top of the soccer goal in the West Town Ponds area across from the high school. So that shows the depth of water that was experienced. And while these areas are designed to hold water, um, this was a significant impact on our system. There was also a lot of private damage. As you can see, on Commerce Drive near Menards West. Many cars were almost half submerged in the street. And then on the right, you can see images of damage that people experienced within their homes. Here's more private damage at GHC in the Sock Trails Clinic. So the image on the left with the red arrow shows where there was debris on a fence. And that means that water was at least that high so that that grass and stuff could be left on that post after it receded. Um, the same is the case for the tree in the middle picture. You can see almost halfway up the tree that there's debris stuck in those branches. And to give you some context for where that was, the picture on the right, those two arrows show where that fence and where that tree is, showing that if cars had been parked in this parking lot during the flood event, almost all of them would have been damaged. Additionally, there was a lot of flooding on the isthmus. The quantity of rainfall overwhelmed the lakes for months and it resulted in standing water for a series of weeks. Um, the picture on the left shows Tenney Park, and the picture on the right 
is a downtown street that has lake water that backed up through the storm sewer and is actually standing in the isthmus. So the city responded by opening the Emergency Operations Center immediately. Engineering staff received over 250 calls and emails. Field reviews were completed of all greenways and shorelines immediately following the event. Crews worked 24-7 to respond to emergencies. There are about 2,000 volunteer hours for sandbagging efforts on the isthmus and other flood-prone areas, and the National Guard assisted with sandbagging efforts for three days. As explained by the pictures and shown in this map, the damage was widespread and also widely underreported. So the map on the right shows damage that was reported to FEMA, and the total reported private damage was $17.5 million. The dots on the map on the right show both um, residential and business damage. However, the estimated damage from having more talks with businesses and residents over the past couple months, um, we believe the damage to be over $30 million. The total damage to public infrastructure was just under $4 million. The city created a flood form for residents to report any flooding they've experienced. If you've not filled out this form, even if you've called 211, spoken to city staff, or reported to FEMA, um, please complete this form at www.cityofmadison.com slash report flooding. As mentioned, a FEMA disaster declaration was made. Further documentation required for reimbursement of claims made by the city. So the city's been working on that over the past few months. Um, and residents were able to file for FEMA aid. That application closed on December 17th, 2018. Flash flooding occurs when pipes are unable to convey the amount of rain that is falling. An easy way to think about this is to think about pipes as underground freeways. So at 5 p.m. on the belt line, an influx of cars causes traffic, which slows down cars and backs up onto ramps. The same thing happens in a storm sewer system when there's a large storm. More water is trying to move through the pipe than it was designed, so everything backs up, and that causes flash flooding that we experience in the streets. The question may be, why doesn't the city design sewers to prevent all flooding? We design our storm sewers like we design freeways. We cannot design to convey every storm like we cannot design freeways with 12 lanes to ensure traffic will never slow. It would be far too expensive of an infrastructure investment. Our design standards balance how critical it is for specific infrastructure to flood with how expensive it is to design and less risk. A channel that if under-designed could flood a house would be designed to handle larger, less probable rain events than a different channel that if under-designed would flood a park. To balance cost and benefit, engineers use design standards. Different types of stormwater infrastructure are designed to convey specific amounts of water. These policies typically look at the cost to, re to move a certain amount of stormwater through the pipe system and the consequences of failure, which might be a small overtopping of the road with no damage, versus the cost to design for a larger rain event, which would mean conveying more water, more water with larger pipes. Why is the city not referring to the 100-year storm? The city is trying to move away from referring to storms by their recurrence interval, such as the 100-year or 10-year event, because this minimizes the perceived risk. Commonly, storms are expressed as having a specific recurrence interval, which is the average time period between the occurrence of storms of the same size, based on historic data. The definition of a 100-year storm does not mean that you should expect a storm that size to occur once every 100 years. In fact, over the course of a 30-year mortgage, there's a 26% chance of, experience, of experiencing a 100-year storm, or a 1% event. So instead of referring to the 100-year storm, the city refers to storms by their annual exceedance probability, which would mean that the 100-year storm has a 1% chance, which is the annual exceedance probability, of occurring each year. The chart on the right shows each storm in the different ways that we can refer to it um, within the engineering world to try to give the public a little bit more of a connection as to why these are referred to in different ways. So now we're going to go through the history of the City of Madison's design standards. Um, back before 1960, many pipes were designed using rules of thumb, large system pipes, think of the main stem of a leaf, were designed using mathematical modeling, but the process was far from standardized. 
From the 1970s to 1980s, pipes were designed to convey mid-sized storms. No attempts to store additional runoff from new development, nor water quality improvements were considered. From the 1970s to 2011, pipes under roads that connect two channels were designed to convey medium-sized storms that have a 10% probability of occurring in one year. In 1983, new development is required to detain medium-sized storms on-site, generally in ponds, to reduce the frequency of downstream flooding. Smaller events passed through the ponds and therefore there was little water treatment, and larger storms overflowed the basins without a rigorously designed flow path. From 1993 to 2001, detention standards were revised to include water quality standards. Pond overflows were reviewed to assure that the overflow took place on public property, but scenarios were not modeled to determine flood elevations. In the mid-2000s, the first standards for the sizing of pipes and inlets serving enclosed depressions, these are areas that do not drain naturally, um, were set for storms that have a 4% chance of occurring each year. In 2004, the state catches up and begins to regulate stormwater, and the city began enforcing infiltration standards. In 2009, new development is required to detain a storm that has a 1% chance of occurring. This helps to prevent downstream flooding. In 2011, pipes under roads that connect two channels are designed to convey a storm that has a 4% probability of occurring, which means that a larger storm can then pass beneath the road without flowing over the road. And in 2016, the standard for sizing pipes and inlets serving enclosed depressions was raised so that a storm that has a 1% chance of occurring can pass without flooding surrounding neighbors, which is an increase from the previous standard. That was a lot of engineering jargon and information, um, with the overall message being that flash flooding can be the result of varying public design standards over the years, combined with limited private design standards. Historically, development didn't rigorously look at minimum first floor elevations or areas of known flood risk, and the city had little purview on designs. This created many flood issues on private property, which are difficult to fix. So the map on the right here shows that history of design standards in pipe form. So here you're looking at pipes that were designed before 1960 that are in red, from 1960 to 1980 are in orange, from 1981 to 2000 are in light green, and from 2001 to 2017 they're in dark green. This map is showing that storm pipes within the city were built when we had a variety of different design standards and private development stormwater standards, such as for new subdivisions, and those lagged even farther behind. So when you have a pipe that was recently designed with new standards flowing into an older pipe, which was designed to convey less flow, you create bottlenecks within the system. As you can see on the map, if you would put a drop of water that would rain over a certain area and it would start flowing through the pipes, if it starts in a green pipe, it might be designed to convey a certain event, but as it flows through and gets to an orange or a red pipe, it might not be design designed to convey the same amount of flow. So while updating these standards mitigate some flooding, there are still ripple effects in the system from older development. Upgrading old pipes to new design standards can be expensive and not feasible. So the simple question would be, why can't we just change all of our pipes to have these new standards? But not only do roads not need replacing, which means that it's expensive to replace just the pipes beneath them, um, but there's also limited space to do so even when we do reconstruct a road and remove those pipes and switch them out. So there's water mains, sanitary sewer, gas, electric, all different utilities are beneath the road, and it's hard to weave larger pipes within an area that have been taken over by other utilities. So engineering design standards cannot prevent all flooding. Even in a perfect world where every pipe in Madison adhered to the same design standard, residents would still experience flooding for a variety of reasons. First floor elevations are not set by standards or regulated. Forest exposures such as window wells or doors create vulnerabilities. Inlets clog and don't function as designed. And the landscape changes such as development, filling wetlands or regrading, which influence what areas flood and where water flows. Additionally, there will always be a rainstorm that's bigger than what the system was designed to convey. Climate change and flooding. The Midwest will continue to experience more extreme storms due to climate change. Per the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, 
the occurrences of three inch or more daily precipitation at the Madison Airport has increased dramatically since the 1950s. The chart on the right shows this. The city has acknowledged this vulnerability and is looking at updating its design standards to reflect rainfall data that incorporates climate change. The city has goals to build flood resilience. Those fall into short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. The short-term goals have been what the city has been working on over the past few months, which include data collection, emergency response for safety issues, emergency repairs, and self-reporting for residents and owners. Once again, the website to do so is www.cityofmadison.com slash report flooding. The midterm goals are to complete more outreach via public information meetings, the waterways newsletter, and website updates. Um, another goal is to kick off our watershed studies to build an emergency, build on our emergency preparedness plan, create a reporting system for city agencies, and work within the lake level technical group. Long-term goals include complete watershed studies to identify deficiencies, continue watershed and flood studies for other areas in the city, and work with the development community to build a more resilient city. As you can see by all of the text in black, watershed studies are a large portion of building flood resilience. Why is the city of Madison looking at watershed studies? The best way to approach citywide flooding issues systematically and equitably is on a watershed scale. A watershed is the area of land in which all precipitation, rain, snow, etc., that falls on it drains to a common waterway, such as a stream, lake, estuary, wetland, aquifer, or even the ocean. The map on the right shows some watersheds within the city of Madison or around the city of Madison. The area that's covered in a light periwinkle is the Lake Wabisa watershed. So any rain that falls on that area will eventually drain out of Lake Wabisa and into Mud Lake. And that outlet point is shown with a star at the bottom of Lake Wabisa. The Mendota watershed is an area that surrounds Lake Mendota and goes significantly farther north. So any rain that falls in that area will eventually drain to Lake Mendota, which will outlet at the Tenney Locks and flow into Lake Monona. And the Pheasant Branch watershed is a smaller watershed within the Mendota watershed, and that is that darker blue smaller outline, and all the water that falls within there eventually drains to Lake Mendota at the mouth of the Pheasant Branch Creek. The graphic on the left shows what a typical watershed looks like. As you can see with the arrows, that any water that falls within the lighter green area eventually all drains into that river. So it flows over cities and farms, through wooded areas, via overland flow, or ends up within the river, and can also flow via groundwater. Um, the majority of the city of Madison is in a watershed that drains to the Ahara chain of lakes. So the watershed acts as a funnel by collecting all the water within an area covered by the basin and channeling it to a single point. Each watershed is separated topographically from adjacent watersheds by a perimeter, such as hills or high points, that form a barrier. As you zoom in on a watershed, there are smaller watersheds within it. So the city has picked different watershed areas to study for 2019. These were picked based on extensive flooding that was experienced in the recent past. These areas include the Madison Pheasant Branch Watershed, the Strickers Mendota Watershed, the Spring Harbor Watershed, the Willow Creek Watershed, the McKenna Green Tree Watershed, Wingro West Watershed, the East Badger Mill Creek Watershed, and the Hawks Landing Watershed. So the city needs to look at watersheds as a whole at the appropriate scale to ensure that solving a flooding problem upstream won't push more water downstream and cause more flooding there. If you think about all the water that's ponded in and around your house if you've flooded or within your basement, and we solve that problem, that water needs to go somewhere. So if we're able to create a model of the existing infrastructure within a watershed, the city can see where flooding may occur during different sized storms. The city can then simulate how different solutions or changes would impact the whole system. Unfortunately, this is not a very quick process. Creating and calibrating the model can take months of work. So to break down that watershed study process a little bit more, 
Um, what happens in the first half of the process is that we model existing conditions and predict future flood risk. In part two of the process, we analyze solutions on a watershed scale, rank those solutions, and budget for those. So step one would be completing the hydraulic modeling. Step two would be looking at the flooding impacts. Step three would be designing engineering solutions. And step four is prioritizing and budgeting. To complete a hydraulic and hydrologic model, you need to gather data and model the existing infrastructure. You can then determine the extent of past flooding. You can look at the flood risk for private property and different sized storms. You install monitoring equipment to measure rainfall and channel flow in each watershed. And then you use that data to be able to calibrate the model with these well-measured storms. So it's easy to create a model and say that these are certain areas that flood but you need to take that model and connect it back to reality, which can be an iterative process that takes a lot of time. A common question that we receive is why do hydraulic and hydrologic models take so long to build? Part of the answer is that there's a lot of inputs. So in starting a model, what you will do is put in all of the different storm pipes and structures that are within that watershed, look at all the impervious data, so anywhere there's a building or a parking lot or a sidewalk or a street, you look at the soils data as well. You have to generate different flow paths. You have to look at and input the topography data, any pond data, any rainfall data, and then all that calibration information as well. Additionally, the city will need to look at the flooding impacts. So the model will show the estimation of properties impacted by a variety of design storms. There will be feedback with residents to see where the model needs more information to be more accurate. For example, the model may show that a specific house doesn't flood, but the homeowner there knows that it has flooded three times in the past year. That is an indication that something is not correct within the model and needs to be tweaked. Additionally, at this point, the city will be providing information for residents about flood proofing their own homes and how to identify which types of flooding can be mitigated immediately. The next step is to look at engineering solutions. Not all improvements can or will be designed to protect properties for storms that have a 1% chance of occurring annually. This is especially true in areas that are being retrofitted or that are limited by existing older private infrastructure. Not all the solutions will be easy. People impacted by the solutions or repairs may not be the same as those benefited by the repairs. So sometimes we cannot fix the flooding in the area that it has flooded, we need to either look upstream or downstream to try to solve some of those problems. Some potential solutions may be an improvement to pipe or inlet capacity, looking at system overflow modifications to make sure there is safe overflow, increasing storage or detention upstream, low impact solutions on private property to solve the issue, such as landscape modifications, high impact solutions on private property to solve issues such as structural changes to a building or building flood walls, the acquisition of properties to be used for stormwater management and flood mitigation, and public works construction for flood repairs and mitigation projects. The final step of the watershed study process is to prioritize and budget. So repairs to the system will require time and money. Not all issues will be fixed immediately. Each solution will be prioritized based on draft criteria. These are the cost benefit ratio, being the value of the property's damage will be compared to the cost of the solutions. The impact on em emergency response routes, how frequently flooding issues occur, independence of other downstream actions or flooding, improvements that mitigate downstream impacts, problems that are not a direct result of a property owner's direct actions, areas with already programmed work, and areas within a neighborhood resource team area. So since August of 2018, the city identified that these watershed studies need to happen and we need to look at this large scale issue. So from September to December, the city has been gathering data and planning how these watershed studies will look. Um, in November and December, the city asked for $775,000 to complete watershed studies. On January 1st, that funding became available. 
This January, we are working on a request for proposal for watershed studies to contract out some of that work, knowing that there's not enough staff internally to complete these in a timely fashion. In March, consultants will begin working on watershed studies, and there will be a public information meetings kickoff. There will be kickoff public information meetings for the watersheds. And then most watershed studies are expected to last 12 to 18 months. There will be more details for each watershed's timing to be shared at the kickoff. Most watershed studies are expected to last 12 to 18 months. More details for each watershed will be shared at the kickoff meetings. What can property owners do? Self-report with the online survey, understand drainage and how to protect your property, install backflow preventers and sump pumps, and purchase supplemental insurance. We'll go through each of these things next. So self-flooding and self-reporting can be done at www.cityofmadison.com slash report flooding. By reporting your flooding, you will help to identify issues and provide more accurate information. This information will be used for prioritization and budgeting of future projects. Please report even if you've already called the city or 211. This form asks for more complete information that will help with the engineering design and prioritization and standardizes all the information that we receive. The flooding and self-reporting can be done for any storm, not just for the storm that occurred in August, and this is not the same as reporting to FEMA. Additionally, at your own home, you can look to make sure that you have good flood prevention practices. So here is kind of a slice through the middle of the home and all of your infrastructure to show what types of things are good prevention practices. So the first thing to look at is if your foundation, your walls, and your sewer are in good condition. So that would mean no cracks or any sort of notable leaking, and those would need to be fixed. Um, you want to make sure that the ground is sloped away from the building or your home. You want to ensure that your downspouts are effectively discharging away from the building. Those should be at least six feet away from your foundation. So a lot of times you need an extension, um, and it's also good to discharge those onto a splash pad. Your drain tile should be connected to sump, your sump pump, which has a battery backup, a generator, or a backup sump pump, depending on how finished your basement is. Your window wells should be covered. Your home should have a well-maintained sanitary lateral with a backflow preventer. And your gutters should be properly installed and cleared of leaves and debris. Backflow preventers and sump pumps. So you install your sump pump, either interior or exterior, which will pump stormwater away from your foundation to prevent leaking and flooding. This is generally something that is done by a professional. Um, depending on how finished your basement is, you may want to look into having a battery backup in case of power failure or having a backup sump pump. Backflow preventers keep sanitary sewer from backing up into your basement. This is separate from the sump pump because that connects into the sanitary system, which functions independently of the storm sewer system. So maintenance is required for proper function because they can get stuck and then in that case they wouldn't work. So you need to know what kind you have and what kind of maintenance is required. The image on the right shows both where a typical sump pump and backflow preventer would be located within your basement. Additionally, you should consider obtaining flood insurance and fully understand the insurance coverage. So FEMA flood insurance is available for everyone, not just people within a specific flood zone area. It's additionally even cheaper if you're not within a flood zone. On top of that, private insurance covers more than FEMA, so oftentimes insurance agents will suggest getting both FEMA and private flood insurance depending on your situation. Your private flood insurance can contain sanitary sewer backup insurance and sump failure insurance. You should contact your insur insurance agent for more information. And with that, we have links for more information um, on the city website. So you can visit the City of Madison flooding website at www.cityofmadison.com flooding. You can take the flood survey at www.cityofmadison.com slash report flooding. You can email city engineering about flood issues at reportflooding at cityofmadison.com. And you can visit 
our website for more information on flood prevention at www.cityofmadison.com slash flood protection. Thank you. Have a nice day.